Everybody having a good show? Got to love iCast. So I'm the guy that they bring on after lunch to wake you all up because I'm loud. So as John said, we're going to talk about content creation and we're going to talk about not making it a, such a thing that's going to take over your life. But everybody knows that right now in just about any industry, content is the new oil. You got to have content or you're not moving anywhere. Now, I'm going to talk about content creation. I'm going to give you some tips for effective content creation. But I got to tell you that everything I planned on talking about today got turned on its head when generative AI came on scene for us in November of 2022. Now, just a heads up, tomorrow afternoon, this same time, same fish channel, same fish time. That's a Batman thing, sort of. but. Um, I will be talking about generative artificial intelligence in this industry. And so today I may mention it here and there, but I'm saving all the good stuff for tomorrow's presentation. So everything that I'm talking about today is going to be about content creation with a little asterisk that says, oh, and by the way, generative AI is going to make this even easier for you. So look for that tomorrow. I will also tomorrow at 11 o'clock be talking about how do you take your social media content and turn that into revenue, which is kind of why we're all here, right? Because we want revenue. So those two sessions tomorrow will be derivative from today's session, though you don't have to have today's session to figure out what's going on with those tomorrow. So just sort of a heads up that what I'm going to talk about with content creation now, AI changes a lot of that, all right? So let's talk about content. I want to talk today about content from two perspectives. I want to talk about low effort content, the stuff that does not take much energy to make, and I want to talk about high effort content, the stuff that you're going to have to spend more time on. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to talk about how easy it is to make low effort content and then what kinds of things you're going to have to do in turning out that higher effort content in order for it to be of value to you. Now, what's interesting about these distinctions between low effort content and high effort content is there is actually no correlation between how much effort you put into your content and what its impact is going to be. And I'm sure you have all had that experience of I snapped a picture, I posted it, and the next thing I know I've got 3,000 likes on it, and then I spent 20, 30 hours producing this video and my mom liked it and that was about it. So there is no direct correlation between how much effort you're putting into content and what the impact actually will be as you work with that content. So let's talk about the objective then being low effort, high impact, because that's the formula, right? We want to spend as little time having to put content out, but we want it to have as big of an effect as possible. So that's sort of the objective, but like I said, there is not a formula for this. If I had the formula for this, I don't think I'd be standing here. I'd be somewhere on my boat in the Keys avoiding all human contact, right? So no formula, but I'm going to give you some tips and some clues. So when I talk about low effort again, I'm talking about stuff that is easy to make, but more important, it's also easy to consume. It does not take your audience much to get what that content does. You don't want your audience going, well, what the hell is this? How do I read this? It's all about that low effort on the production end and on the consumption end. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about low effort. You want to snap, you want to post, you want somebody to click, you want them to laugh, you want them to hit the like. It's a very easy low effort process. So. One of the rules that I sort of live by or should live by, this is one of those things, do as I say, not as I do. But when it comes to content creation and content circulation, the circulation is the important part, putting it in your audience's hands, getting it on their screen. So I always like to operate with an 80-20 rule. This is also a rule I operate with when fishing. 80% of the time, I like to focus on areas I know and that I'm familiar with. But in all fishing trips, dedicate 20% to learning a new place. With content creation, I want to spend 20% of my time 
developing that content, low effort, remember, but I want to spend 80% of my time circulating it because that's where the real impact is, is whose hands are you putting this in? So I spend more time worrying about where it's going and how I'm going to get it than I do in making it. Remember, low effort. So when we talk about why we're creating content and why we're creating effective content in particular, we need to think about what is it we want out of our content. Do we want increased web traffic? Do we want increased impressions, more views, more likes? Do we want more shares? Do we want more circulation? That for me is one of the big keys. Is it about our brand visibility? And if so, how are we working brand visibility into our content creation? Is it just we want click-throughs? Do we just want people clicking on stuff? Or are we also trying to have our content provide particular value to your objective? How is it promoting what it is you're trying to do in a larger campaign rather than just, ooh, I snapped a really cool picture of a snook swimming in the mangroves and I got 3,000 likes. What does that have to do with your larger objectives and what you're trying to accomplish? And that will change depending on, uh, on whether you're an influencer or whether you're a company, a marketing agency. All those things will change on what value you're getting for your content. And then one of the other things that I like to recommend about effective content is this concept of thought leadership. You want your content to identify you as an expert in this area. And this becomes very important, particularly when we're working with branding, because there's a big difference in receiving 3,000 clicks because I got a really cute picture of my three-year-old son holding a 28-inch snook versus I've got a post about how to use, how to, how to slow troll um, jerk baits in the winter for snook. Right? There's a difference in the area of expertise I'm projecting with those kinds of posts. So part of the objective there is, sorry, we got a weird connection going on here. It, part of the, objection, of, of the objective then for effective content, because you're wanting to establish your expertise, you want to be seen as an expert in the area if that's, how, if that's what your, your value-driven approach to content is. All right, now, the truth of the matter is all of our content we want it to drive revenue. This is an industry, this is a business. We are here for a reason at ICAST, and that's to profit and make money from this industry, correct? So, like I said, tomorrow I'll be talking about that transition from content to revenue, but this is one of the big purposes of effective content. Now, I'm gonna talk now about some low effort content. The easiest low effort content right now are the pictures that you post. Snap, click, Laugh like. It's very easy. That almost sounds like live, love, whatever that does. So don't, do not quote that for me, please. Um, but that's sort of the purpose of just posting pictures. And part of what you're doing here also is, yeah, it's eye candy. Not that one particularly. But um, part of what you're also doing is establishing reputation, right? So here in Florida, that picture is not going to create what the, uh, the impression that I want as it would in California, because that's a, a California uh, sheep's head, and in Florida our sheep's head look different. So now if I start talking about sheep's head in Florida, people are going to say, yeah, but you don't know anything about sheep's head. So you got to think through, or your image, what brand, what are you doing with your, your low effort content? What, what message is it sending about me? Live feed videos. These have become so popular. Turn your phone on, record a few little bits, and get it posted. This is all low effort. How easy is it to post video at this point, right? This is all low effort content. And let's face it, when you're scrolling, when you're the consumer, are you stopping to read a hundred word text post or are you stopping to watch a two minute video? And so low effort and you'll drive higher viewing. The other thing is shared content. How easy is it to share something cool that somebody else does? So Chase Bates, you know, great company out of Australia, post this awesome picture. I want people to see it because it's an awesome picture. Share. That's low effort content on your behalf and it's drawing both to you and to whoever you're, put, you're sharing with. The other thing about low effort content is replication. Being sure that if I'm snapping a picture and posting it on my Insta account, that I'm also posting it on my Twitter, on my Facebook, on my own web page. That notion of replication. What it does is it gives you more platform direction 
with the same piece of content. So you're getting more bang for your buck. But what drives this and what you have to really think about are what are your platform needs. And what I mean by that is where is your audience? So for instance, your audience may not be an Instagram audience. Your audience may be Twitter or threads or something that's a little more text-based than the image base of Instagram. You may not have, I mean, let's face it, the audience difference between a TikTok audience and a Facebook audience are pretty different. And so part of what you're having to think through is how, what platform am I sharing stuff on to get my highest feedback, my highest rate of return on taking that low effort content public. And so what I find is if I've got a post that I'm making, so for instance, this is a post that I ran on um, Costa Sunglasses a while back, and so it's got my, my YouTube gear review of the sunglasses, it's got my uh, web page version, it's got my Twitter version, my Facebook version, all the same content, low effort content that I'm replicating on multiple platforms in order to draw in multiple audiences from different places. Now, what's interesting about this too is to make it even more low effort, there are platforms that will automate these distributions for you. Things like Hootsuite, where you can tell it, whenever I put something on Hootsuite, I want it to go to my Twitter, to my Facebook, to this, that, or the other. And even within a lot of these platforms, you can load up YouTube with multiple posts and tell it when to post it. So you can automate actually when it's posting it. You don't have to hit send on everything. Now, what, the way this affects low effort content is I could spend an hour tomorrow morning producing 15 or 20 posts and then load it up into my automated delivery system and now I don't have to worry about anything this week. Right, it's taking care of it for me so that every day I'm not having to do something. A lot, lot, a lot more productivity that way. So another great thing about low effort content is we all, I, I thoroughly believe in everything that we do professionally, maybe personally too, but everything we do professionally, we do not take advantage of our networks to the extent that we can that we know lots of people who are professionals, we know lots of other content that is out there, and we also have people who can help us produce content. So one of the things that I always recommend in order to take some of the burden off of you as a, a company, as an individual, in turning out content, is to look for content that your customers and that your employees are already presenting for you. So if you've got three or four employees, you ask them, hey, can you tell me a little fishing story? Can you share one of the pictures of you fishing in our gear? And now I've got employees who are generating content for me. Or I look at customer reviews and I identify, hey, Joe Schmo from wherever posted, hey, I really like this reel. It's got one of the smoothest drags I've ever used. And I'll take that and I'll cut it and I'll put it out and say, hey, thanks Joe Schmo for this great comment about our reel. All that took was a couple of seconds of sharing and commenting. And what that also does is now if you tag that person, that person takes acknowledgement. Imagine when a big company, like you know, one of the big companies out here, takes your comment and posts it, and now you're identified as somebody who comments on Daiwa, Shimano, Strike King, you know, whatever it happens to be. Now you're part of the conversation. And as a customer, how does that make you feel? I've been acknowledged by this big company, and they've shared. My, how many of you have ever had that moment where you've said, oh look, so-and-so shared my, my post because it gives connection and it boosts ego and, and uh, ethos there at the same time. So look for the content that's already there for, from your customers and from your employees. Recycle your content. Once you make a post, store that in an archive. You can use it again. If I make a post today, if I snapped a picture right now of you all, and I posted it. Six months from now, if I post it again, how many people who see that post six months from now are gonna remember the first time I posted it? They're not, they're gonna see it as a new post. And the way the algorithm works is likely it'll put it in, in, in a whole bunch of other people's uh, uh, thread rather than the people who saw it initially. So recycle, and recycle posts that are calendar driven. So I've been using this happy new year uh, post for a couple of years now. I don't have to make a new one every year. I just go to my archive, repost, right? And you could even schedule that out in advance. Um, I actually, if I were doing this efficiently, what I would do, 
and I'll show you some methods for this in a second, what I would do is create 365 posts. Take a weekend, make 365 po uh, posts, dump them into an automation where it's posting one a day, and then have it start over the next year, and calendar tie it, right? Happy July 4th, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, you know, thanks to our veterans. Let's remember on this, you know, and have those generate every single day. I mean, I admittedly, every, every, um, uh, every uh, Pearl Harbor Day, I post the same Snoopy cartoon every single Pearl Harbor Day. Why don't I just do that automatically, right? So think about recycling and how that can add to you. You don't have to have new stuff every single time you post. All right, so that's some low effort approaches. The high effort stuff, this is a long list. This is where we start to talk about those magazine articles, where we talk about blog posts, where we're talking about the brochures you produce, the crowdsource content that you're producing, customer content, like I mentioned, but larger, more data visualization and data approaches to what your customers are saying. Data visualizations are great. You know, to be able to go into your data analysis and take that information and convey it in visualization about what you're actually doing. More professionally produced videos, not those quick snap videos, but the ones you're dumping into Premiere or Final Cut or whatever you're using, uh, Adobe Rush, whatever it happens to be, and that you're actually producing. And let's face it, those videos capture an immense amount of attention. I am, you know, think about what Blacktip did with their video production. Think about what Sims does with their video production. Think about all these companies that create these nice little short films and you just wowed by them. And they're building brand, they're building ethos, and they're tying, and you're watching because those videos are capturing. Um, you know, again, employee content can be spelled out, infographics, interviews, media guides, newsletters, podcasts, reviews. All of these are high effort content. These are the things that are gonna take more time. And again, remember, the amount of time you're putting in to high effort versus low effort will not necessarily affect the impact you're going to get back from them. All right, stop. Now it's hammer time. All right, now, now, let's talk about how we're gonna do this. Again, now is the time you have to bang this stuff out. You have to make it. So the first thing is, like I said, we don't use our networks the way we should. Get content from your employees, get content from your customers, and use your engagement. Adapt and adopt the stuff that people are responding to. And what I mean by that is start looking in your social media for recurring concepts, the topics that are coming up, themes from your previous posts. Look back at which posts that you have that are doing better than others and ask yourself, what's the content here? Why are more people responding to this than others? Look for the themes. What is it they're looking for in your content? And identify what your audience is responding to and play into that, okay? Now, this is something I'm a big fan of. Look at trend data. There are a lot of services out there, right down to Google Analytics and Google Trends, which are free, that will tell you what people are talking about that day, that week, on the internet. And now you can map into that. So I use BuzzSumo a, bit, a bunch, and what you can do is you can specify. I wanna know, about, I can go to the fishing category. I wanna know conversations about fishing. All right, I specifically wanna know about conversations going on on the internet about redfish on the west coast of Florida. And now what I'm gonna get are alerts. These are the topics that are being discussed. Here's where it's being discussed. And my brain can now say, I need to write a post about fishing with saltwater assassins for redfish out of Cedar Key, Florida, because that's the, those are the topics that are getting hit across the internet the most. And so I really recommend looking at trend data, because how many times are you sitting there going, oh God, what should I post today? Trend data, Hootsuite, TweetDeck, all of these different services will give you a key into what people are talking about. Because if people are talking about it and they're Googling it or they're binging it or you know, whatever search engine, and those things are what are already coming up in the data, you want to put yourself into that mix. Now, we could have a philosophical question about that because that just sounds like you're trying to run with the pack. And you might want to find a way, you know, I don't want to be with the pack. But let me tell you, if the pack's going in a certain direction and you want to ride along, 
trend data is a way to figure out at least where they're going. So I really recommend looking at, at trend data services. And some of them are free, and like everything else, and I'll talk about this in detail tomorrow, money will get you more. And so some of these services, the more you pay them for what you're going to get, the more details you're going to get on what content is going on right now. Spinoff content. If you have a post that has received enough response, engagement, clicks, likes, hearts, whatever it is that you think, ah, oh, that was a good post, your immediate thought should be, all right, what's all the spinoff content? So in this sort of thought tree here, if you've got a product release on a new spinning reel that people are clicking on, now you start to spell out, you spin off of that. I need a post on the gear ratio, on the drag, on the line capacity, on what rods to pair this reel with. What, um, you know, what are the recommended uses here? Is this a flipping rod or a finesse rod? Or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And each one of those should lead to another layer of what the spinoff content is. So I always recommend that if you're going to make a post and you see that it's getting a lot of response, identify what are the related parts to this post that I can now share to keep this conversation going. All right, here's the important part. 80% of all public communication now occurs visually. And visuals are no longer just attention getters, they convey information. And what I mean by that, not just a graphic or a chart or a table that is technically designed to convey information, but every video, every picture that you are posting is sending a kind of information to your reader. Whether it's in the apparel you're wearing, whether it's in them trying to figure out how did they catch this, whether they're looking at that 40 inch snook going, oh God, I gotta get to be a member of the 40 inch club. There's something they are interpreting from that image beyond, ooh, that's pretty. The eye candy thing only gets you so far. But when you look at public communication now, 80% of our communication publicly is now visual. We are more apt to scroll past the long alphabetic text post and stop on the images and watch the videos. Even if it would only take me 30 seconds to read that textual post, I'm more likely to watch a two and a half minute video than I am to read that now. And so visuals drive content. I'm going to talk about three different ways to get your, your visuals. And again, all of this gets upended by generative AI. So I'm going to talk about images that are self-made, I'm going to talk about images that are found, and I'm going to talk about database and stock images. So, oh yeah, this is the, the interruption. This is where AI tears into this. This is the moment where all three of those categorizations just go away. And yeah, all of that I generated using AI. It took me about 35 seconds to make that slide using AI. So again, quick reminder, self-plug, right? Repetition, always good. Tomorrow, AI. So self-made images, these are the pictures that you're taking. Now, here's the thing about self-made images. If you're just holding up your phone and taking a picture, that's fantastic. But if you're paying attention to how you're taking that picture, or if you're editing that picture before you post it, you're going to get a lot more out of it. All of these pictures were snapped using either a small digital camera or a phone. And all three of these images are not what you would expect to see on Instagram per se. They've been cropped, they've been edited, they've also, I mean, the one on the, the far left that's the bi-level shot underwater and above shot, all of these things are just self-made images. And here's, here's the thing about self-made images. It used to be that we would wait and we'd line up the hero shot and we'd take the picture and we'd go, all right, digital, burst shoot everything, Brrr, move your cameras around, get different angles, get down low, get up high, because what you're going to end up with is your own database, your own archive. And if I take a picture of you weighing back on a rod from up here, that has a very different dramatic effect than if I get down here and shoot up. And now I post one, and two weeks later I post the other, and your audience doesn't realize, same scene, and now I've got two dramatic effects in self-made. So part of what I'm recommending is that when you're taking your pictures, 
do stuff that's not just take a picture. Different angles, different filters, whatever it happens to be. So those are self-made. That's the easiest thing in the world. We're all doing that also. So these are my three rules of, of taking pictures. Take a lot of them. You know, if you snap one picture on the boat, and let's face it, this is the hardest thing in the world, actually, right? How many of you, when you're fishing, want to sit there taking 100 pictures on one fish fight, and how many of you want to get the rod back in the water and fish? Right? That's always the hard part of, did you get any pictures? Oh, crap, no. Right, I caught a fish. I like that better. Take lots of pictures. Make a list of what pictures you want before you go out. How many times, particularly anybody, influencer, gear reviewer, magazine writer, when you go out, you have in your mind, oh, I need to get a picture of this product doing this. And then you get back to the dock and you go, oh, God, I never took that picture. Because you're so caught up in the moment. I mean, make a list of what you want to accomplish on each time you go out to take pictures. And learn your editing software. This is easy. It's built into your phone. Crop stuff out. And I wish I could show you the Gen AI stuff. You can completely change images now to get whatever you want. You want a lighthouse in the back? Add it. You want somebody to look different? Add it. You don't want that product? Take it out. You don't want that other boat in the picture? Take it out. But learn your editing software. Those are my three rules for self-made images. Now, found images are the images that are already out there that we recirculate. So a lot of times we'll see a picture and we'll take it and we'll use it for our own purpose. Not a share, not where you're giving credit, but where you're identifying it. So, you know, you get a picture of somebody like Darcy, and this is actually a picture that was posted um, in Queensland in Australia of, you know, one of our Florida anglers and one of the big influencers in saltwater fishing. They found the image and they, they use it. The thing you have to be careful about in found images is people will come after you for copyright violation if you are using their images without permission. Prime example, this is a picture that I took that was published in an article I did for Saltwater Sportsman a few years ago. Small mangrove snapper with a voodoo shrimp. And several weeks later, on Real Pursuit, yeah, I'm calling you out if you're here, um, I find my image that I took uncredited in their publications. That's a no-no, people. So when you're going to find somebody else's image and use something that somebody else took a picture of, get permission and give credit. But found images are a good way to find stuff. Now, the other thing is database, stock images. I really recommend that if you have to turn out rapid content regularly, that you subscribe to some database, whether it's stock image or, you know, there, there are a bunch of them out there. Um, Adobe stock, um, I'm blanking on others. But all you have to do is do a search for, I want a picture of somebody holding a fishing rod. See that picture up there in the top right of, of the screen? Does that look somewhat familiar? It's not the exact, but it's out of the same database series, right? as the logo, the iCast, right? Everybody see that? And in fact, I, I can show you a lot of ASA stuff that uses stock image. Stock image is great because you, get the, you download it, you use the rights, it's yours. You can change it, manipulate it, do what you want. And particularly if you've got to turn stuff out, stock image is just a great way to go in terms of, of stuff. And there's a lot of free stock out there. You know, you need a picture of a marlin and you don't have a chance to go out and go marlin fishing, Find it on stock. And stock is safer than doing a web search and copying it because now you're risking copyright violation. Okay, video. I take my video premise from Lego Batman. Always be recording. Because you're gonna miss stuff if you don't have that camera on. Quite literally last week, I'm fishing out of Key West and I'm driving the boat. My son is sitting in front of me and he turns to me very slowly and he says, Dad, look to the right. And I look to the right and there is a flying fish at exact eye level hanging in the air of the boat, moving at exact, I mean, we are eye to eye, just moving like this. And of course, by the time I turn to get the camera and turn back, bam, he's back in the water. Had I had a camera on at some angle in the boat, chances are would have had that great, amazing shot. Always be recording. 
Learn video editing software. Um, video editing software can be as simple as the stuff that's on your phone. It can be as professional as Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro. I spend most of my time living in the Premiere Pro zone just focused on, on video editing. There's a difference in aesthetic and there is a difference in ethos when you put something up that is just raw off your phone, it can be very popular, can be, but there's a difference when you start adding those professional touches, cropping out the unnecessary, really focusing, you know, bringing up the contrast, whatever it happens to be. Learn editing software. So one of the things that I'm not going to be able to show you um, in terms of content creation just because of the way this works, Adobe has just released it's Express Beta. This is a platform that will make anything you want. So when you open it and this screen opens up, the first thing you do is click on what do you want to make. You want an Instagram story, you want an Instagram post, you want a TikTok video. You go through and you identify, what are you, are you making a logo? Are you going to make a greeting card? Whatever it is you want to make, you click on it, it opens it up, and in the right column it provides stock images. You can start pulling it. It makes content go so fast. And now, with its embedded generative AI, you don't even have to do the actual work. You can say, I need a picture of a fish that does it. Bam, 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 it all builds it out. Make it an Instagram, bam, there it is. And so content creation becomes very easy using these new platforms. And Adobe Express is in beta, but it's getting ready to come out. You can, you can get the beta um, and, and just see how amazing it is to just have it make stuff. Um, it'll, it'll amp up the way you're creating content. So the other thing that I recommend is to, for saving time is look at templates, particularly in video templates. Motion Array uh, is a style of video. And a real quick anecdote here. The way I started looking at templates, um, anybody remember the horror movie Us? Uh, came out pre-COVID. You all know what I'm talking about. So I was at another movie, I'm a movie junkie, it was another movie, and I'm watching the premiere for us on this big screen, and it's using this ink blot technique where you know it, it, uh, ink splashes on the screen and you get the image through it. And I'm looking at this going, my God, this looks familiar. And this is a big Hollywood, I go to motion, one of the motion array, 30 bucks I can have that same exact template and put in my own graphics and it makes that Hollywood quality video for you. And there are dozens of these uh, sites where you can download free templates that work with your video editing software and you can make Hollywood caliber video in a matter of moments by using templates that are already out there. You don't have to start from blank raw screen. You can always make your productivity elevate by using the tools that are already out there. All right, so that's what I got to say about content creation today. Ran through that pretty quickly. Um, I, we will have Q&A now. There's a lot we could talk about here. Uh, and if the Q&A goes over, just so everybody knows, um, for the next hour after this, I'll be at the ASA Pavilion if anybody wants to talk further about any of this stuff. But that's my rapid shot at how content creation doesn't have to be as time consuming as a lot of people think it has to be. Anybody can do it, it's just a matter of thinking through, what do I need, how am I gonna get it, and how am I gonna circulate it, and it's pretty quick and pretty easy these days. So thank you all for listening to me ramble. 